here today. Thank you so much for joining us for today's session. You're in for a wonderful treat. Dr. Ann Koch is a fantastic speaker and has some really important information to share with you. I think you're going to absolutely um, love her and love the presentation. This presentation is part of the LGBT Health Certificate Series. This is a series that we've offered for the past four years. Um, over 200 people have earned a certificate in that time. And if you too are interested in earning a certificate, you can learn more by going on the UofL website and doing a search for LGBT Health Certificate. So please um, learn more. You're also welcome to ask me or Chaz questions about it today. At the end of this session, I encourage you to fill out an evaluation. Those are incredibly helpful for us to continue improving the certificate series and offering um, an even better series next year. So thank you for that. And to introduce our speaker today is Dean Bradley of uh, School of Dentistry. So thank you very much, Dean Bradley. Great. Thanks, Stacey. Hi there. Welcome. Um, you know, I am thrilled uh, today to welcome our renowned speaker, uh, Anne Koch. Uh, Anne received both her DMD and Certificate in Endodontics uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. She is also the founder and past director of the postdoctoral program in endodontics at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Following her clinical and academic career, Dr. Koch formed her own successful technology and development company, Real World Endo, of which she is CEO and president. Dr. Koch is the holder of multiple patents. Transgender patients have historically been stigmatized both in the medical and dental fields. Behind all stigmati stigmatization and bigotry is a lack of education, knowledge, and the willingness to have an open mind and an open heart. We at the University Louisville, of Louisville, I'm still practicing that, Louisville, <laughs> School of Dentistry and Medicine, have a belief and value system that embraces diversity in all its forms. And our goal is to be of service to our patients with all their needs. The purpose of this presentation is to educate students, faculty, residents, and staff about the medical and psychological needs of transgender individuals. We are thrilled to see so many of you today from the School of Dentistry, as well as all of our HSC schools and the community. So again, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Anne Koch, Koch, and the title of our presentation is The Treatment of the Transgender Dental Patient. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'm so thrilled to be here in Louisville, and I am so flattered by this type of attendance. I know all of you have some place to go, especially the students. I know you have another class coming up at, at 1 o'clock. But this is indeed an important topic, and what I want to do, and the reason I'm here, is the fact that I want to drive to make this legitimate. The whole thing for me here is about legitimacy. And I'm not going to stop until transgender medicine becomes a legitimate part of the medical school curriculum as well as other allied health professional schools, in particular also the dental school. Um, I'm a little cramped on time, but I'm going to speak. I speak kind of rapidly, as you probably understand. We're going to cover a lot of information. And it's going to basically be <clears throat> a personal narrative of my own transition at age 63. And in addition to my own personal narrative, I'm going to address certain pertinent issues, or at least pertinent issues the way I see it. At the conclusion of this, I didn't come to Louisville to eat lunch. I came to Louisville to educate and share my experiences. So when this presentation concludes, I will stay around the entire day as long as necessary to answer everyone's questions, OK? That's the deal. Having said that, let's start. Again, that's basically the disclosure. We all know that. This is me, OK? This is me, 1951. So all you dental students quickly can do the math, like, oh my god, she's really old. <laughs> I have been around a while, trust me, okay? 
And uh, I went through, you know, school. I was a really good student. I had been skipped a year in school. Um, I was a really good athlete. Ended up being all Long Island in two sports, in baseball and in football. Um, but I was very aware of this issue since about four and a half years old. Hated the boys' locker room, but there was never a team bus from Smithtown High School that would ever leave without me. And you have to realize, I went to a high school where we had more than 700 kids in a class. So it was not some type of weenie little high school. It was a big time school. And at 14 years old, I was the youngest starting varsity quarterback on Long Island. So I had a wonderful time growing up. But it never, never went away, nor does it ever go away. So that's one thing. I was really flattered in the second year of the Hall of Fame creation at a high school. I was elected um, and I was really proud of that. So that's a picture of the old Ken Koch right there. Not there, there, okay? <laughs> so let's jump forward to dental school. And this is at the University of Pennsylvania. And I show this picture for a couple of reasons. Firstly and foremost, I show this picture because the 70s was really a decade for bad fashion, okay? <laughs> and um, also, if any of you are familiar with Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, there is a park near the Penn campus called Clark Park. And Clark Park is famous for three things. Homeless people, drug dealers, and Hall and & Oates. And, and Hall and & Oates used to do, I love dance music, Hall and & Oates used to do free concerts. And um, I was speaking one time in Philadelphia, and I was a, an African-American attorney in the audience, who was a good friend of mine, and she said, Annie, I love it, that's a compilation of both Hall and & Oates in one picture. So <laughs> that's why I show it. All right, after I left dental school, fast forwarding here, um, and I do another presentation where I get into particulars, I ended up joining the Air Force. And I went over to Japan, and um, I liked the club scene, and somebody said to me, hey, have you ever gone to a modeling agency? Did you ever think of modeling? So I said, no, and they gave me the name, so I went in, and that first week they sent me to three look-sees, two for commercials and one for a modeling job, and I scored all three. So lo and behold, I became a commercial TV actor and uh, model. I did that for five years, and I made more than 40 major TV commercials. And I'm going to show you an image here because I'm very proud of this. This was the commercial of the year in 1983 for Japan, and it also won a number of awards in Europe. But when I show you the commercial, I think you're going to be surprised. <laughs> あれは、50人の電話番号を覚える。この時計さえあれば何にもいらないと申しております。男は腕に電話帳、歌詞をテレメも50。I um, I speak Japanese. Thank you. <laughs> oh my god, you love me. Thank you so much, right? Um, and actually what they're saying there is the fact that that watch did so many functions, I forgot to get totally dressed. And I was telling um Stacy um one of my patients one day was a, a pilot. It was an Air Force pilot, a C-130 jockey, and he had just come back from Hong Kong. So he came back to me and he said, hey, Doc, he said, I, I just came back from Hong Kong, and he said, I saw you on a billboard. And I had done a lot of billboards, so I said, really? He goes, yeah, and he said, you weren't wearing any clothes. <laughs> so I said, um, why don't you and I just keep a secret, keep that a secret between the both of us and eight million Hong Kong Chinese, okay? Um, I led a charmed life in Japan. Um, it was fun. This was another great commercial. I won't show you the uh, vid, but this is for the Wright Brothers. Um, this was a really, really fancy commercial, and I'm showing only this still so that you realize they did a bunch of commercials with clothes on, okay? <laughs> and um, they found this guy in London. They found me in Tokyo, and the name of the product was Morinaga Creep. Kripu, as they say in Katakana, and it was a coffee creamer. But in addition to doing a whole campaign, we also did a, um, a sepia version for United Airlines that they used in celebrating their trans-Pacific uh, flights. So I loved it. I had a great time. I went all over Asia. I really couldn't believe I was getting paid doing it. And the best part was, um, when you do that professionally, you have a composite card. And you know, it's got all the different poses and everything. And I had the composite card, and it was in all the clubs, so for five years I got into all the clubs free. 
So that to me was a lot of fun. A couple of other things about my life at the time. Um, this is me. Um, I was known among the casting directors. This is so ironic now. I was known as the man of a thousand faces. I could do all kinds of characters. The only thing I never did either in print or commercial was a doctor. Five times I went for look-sees for a doctor and all times I got rejected. And I said, no, you guys don't understand. Trust me, I'm really a doctor. And they said, you may be a doctor, but you don't look like a doctor. <laughs> and um, uh, just to let you know what was going on socially, this was my girlfriend and she was Miss Okinawa. So in terms of being a guy and a guy having it, getting it on, I had a great life. Um, and I'm doing a book, and hopefully it's going to be done by the early spring, and I talk about this because even though this was going on, that feeling uh, just never, ever left. And it was so funny about the doctor thing. I may not look like a doctor, but um, in 1984, I was the Fujitsu man for Australia and New Zealand. And the reason I got the job was for one simple reason. They liked my neck. And that's how it works in that industry. They like, I did a lot of you know, campaign pictures, videos, shooting me at a keyboard. I had no idea what I was doing on a keyboard. Uh, but the reason I was the Fujitsu guy was mainly because of my neck. This is a picture. I kind of have that you know, um, George Michael two or three day growth going on here. Uh, this was in 1986, and this is how, this is how I remember Ken. And for people who fully transition, I think most of us think of our previous persona as like a brother or a sister. So I have no hesitation talking about my life as Ken. I'm very proud of what I was able to accomplish as Ken. I was pr very proud of who Ken was. But when I think of this and I see a picture like this, I think of this really as kind of my brother. Uh, in the Air Force, I spent a lot. I had a lot of fun in the Air Force. This is the first selfie I ever took. This is me in the back of an F-4, and um, and I did a lot of flying. After dental school, I was in the Air Force. I was doing prosthodontics for you dental students. I'm both a prosthodontist and an endodontist. And what happened was that I was doing all this stuff. Where eventually, there I am. Oh, by the way, for non-dentists. Let me just clear up something. People think nitrous oxide is there for the patient's use. That's so silly. It's obviously there for the provider's enjoyment. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Don't send me emails, OK? Um, I was chief of prosthodontists at McGuire Air Force Base in 1991. And in 1991, I came to a fork in the road. And this is what the fork was. I was going to either change gender and then go to medical school, because I knew it was going to be tough getting a job, and I was interested in facial plastics. I didn't know if I could get into maybe the MD program of my choice, but I was very confident I could get into a, a, a DO program. But the only way to make it fair, I loved endodontics. I was doing prosthodontics at the time, but I loved doing endo. And I said, wait a second, I'm going to apply to one endodontic program, I'm going to apply to the best program and the most competitive to get into. And that was the University of Pennsylvania, my alma mater. So I figured, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to let fate show her hand. If I get rejected at endo, I'm going to change gender, go to medical school. If I get accepted to endo, I'm going to go into endo, and that'll take care of that. Well, obviously, since I'm standing you in front of you, that didn't quite work out that way. Um, but I have no hesitation. I have no regrets going to endodontic school. I ended up treating tens and tens of thousands of patients. I created lots of products and techniques, one of which now has more than 10 million completed cases worldwide, created a residency program, all that stuff. So I don't for one second regret in 1991 not changing gender but going to endodontic training. Right? I'm just happy that I was able to do the gender transition at age 63. So getting back to the screen, this is the University of Pennsylvania. That's the, what we call the, the Evans Museum. That was me, you know, young and innocent, you know, anesthetizing a patient. Things haven't changed. After I left dental school, I went up to Boston, and I was asked to create an endodontic program for Harvard uh, University, for the School of Dental Medicine. So I was really pleased to do that because I was able to institute all my ideas and concepts 
I had a crazy, ridiculous budget of $3,500. And that was to run an existing undergraduate endodontic program as well as creating from scratch a new postdoctoral program. But at Harvard, they realized, well, we don't have to pay anybody. Somebody will be stupid enough to take it. And that's where I came in. Um, but as I said to Stacy before, my ID at the time, I kind of looked like Michael J. Fox. You know, I kind of got that Fox thing going on. Then eventually, um, I left Harvard. And ultimately, I created a bunch of techniques, created my own company. And the company I created was Real World Endo. And I found myself 42 to 44 weeks a year going around the world lecturing. I also had 30 other specialists who would lecture for my company. Did lots of hands-on. I love the interaction. I love teaching. I think you've probably figured this out. I'm by nature a social person, OK? And that's what we did. This was the last dental event I did as Ken. I was a keynote at the California Dental Association. I've been a keynote at that meeting probably five times in my life. But I knew I'd already had, had a little bit of facial surgery done. I knew what was going on. Um, I had started taking hormones. And it was so funny. When I gave that lecture, I was in front of the audience. I had about 650 people. And I was stunned. And I said, you know, I've done this meeting many times. And I'm stunned that so many people showed up for my lecture. I said, if I knew this many people were going to show up, I would have had my hair done. <laughs> and they laughed and thought I was kidding. I, of course, was being totally serious. Um, but that's me. That's the last picture of um, Dr. Koch. That's kind of a change. Okay? So um, that looks kind of OK by itself. But to really understand how significant a transformation can be, take a look at this one. What happened here was. You get to a point, if you're not doing this, and you need to do this, and you want to do this, you kind of go on autopilot. And for me, on autopilot, I was doing something I loved, meaning lecturing. Um, I liked teaching. Um, I lived in two beautiful homes. I had a boat. I was in, kind of enjoying life, but just as on autopilot, I was making a lot of money. And you're just kind of blank. Where my world changed, and that's me these days on Cape Cod, where my world changed was in May of 2011 when I was diagnosed with a squamous cell cancer on the back of my right hand. Fortunately, in dermatological cancers, we have melanoma, non-melanoma. And a squamous cell dermatological cancer can metastasize, although it generally doesn't unless it's a severely, severely immunocompromised patient, and I wasn't. But in my world, in your world as dentists, the oral cavity, a squamous cell cancer diagnosis is an onerous diagnosis. The five-year survival rate is probably somewhere 31 to 33 percent. And doing maxillofacial pros, I was in many surgeries where we took ribs and we ended up trying to restore a mandible. These, you know, just trying to improve the quality of life. So when I heard the term squamous cell cancer, it rocked my world. And one of the things with older people who are thinking of transitioning, there's usually a seminal event, car accident, death of a spouse, death of a relative, cancer diagnosis, cancer survival, that acts as a trigger. And like, I've got to do it before I die. Game over, flip all the cards, I've got to do it. And that's what happened to me in May, two weeks before my specialty meeting in 2011. And I ended up, over the next few months, purposely losing 65 pounds. And um, people thought I had uh, cancer, maybe I had AIDS or something. But it was purposely done because I had made the commitment to transition. In addition to doing things right now, uh, I'm also really involved athletically. I play a lot of competitive tennis. And tennis has been a really, really big part of my life. And that's a pick from that. Including I won the New England Women's um, Senior Tennis Championships uh, last year. And in the semifinals, I beat the number one senior player in the country. I beat her three and three in the semifinals. And it was so funny because the next day, this lady shows up at the courts where the finals are going to be played. So she comes up to me and she goes, um, oh, she said, I see you went to the University of Pennsylvania. I said, I did. She said, I guess you played a lot of sports. I said, I did. She said, I guess you played uh, varsity tennis. I said, I didn't. 
So I said I played uh, ice hockey, which I did, and softball. I didn't want to say ice hockey and baseball. <laughs> but um, it was great because I beat her three and three and I ran her butt all over the court. <laughs> so treating the transgender patient. Let's, this is why we're here today. Then I'm going to talk about facial surgery. A couple of things we all need to review here is background, how to create a welcoming environment, and let's have a protocol for how to treat these individuals. Maureen Osborne, I think, is possibly the most experienced therapist working in this space. She's been in many documentaries. She worked out of Philadelphia for years. She's now retired, sees patients only one day a week, interestingly enough, on Cape Cod. So I'm good friends with Maureen and her husband. She sent me this one time in an email, and I realized, oh my God, this is spot on. So read this. I believe that the trans community is vast and varied with all manner of perspectives represented. Absolutely. The main thing they all share is the struggle to be authentic, to be known, to be heard and received. It is truly a civil rights struggle and in a larger frame, a paradigm change for the way we think about gender. This is absolutely right on, spot on. One of the things in, in certain places you have to understand I was very successful as a guy. I'm doing pretty well as a professional woman. I'm very comfortable in the world of binary. Every transgender, every gender confirmation surgeon I know is also more comfortable in a binary world. But every one of us totally understands and, and appreciates it's not strictly a bi bi binary world. It's a continuum. It's a spectrum. There's all kinds of different aspects. There's all different waypoints on the gender spectrum. Part of that is the pronouns. And people have a right to be addressed the way they want to be addressed. So, you know, non-binary, he, she, that kind of stuff. But as you get into gender-fluid individuals, as you get into gender non-conforming, you're going to come across a lot of individuals who prefer, and they have the right, of Z or they. So one of the things for me is when you're meeting trans people initially, so many of these patients have been jerked around by the medical system, not just medicine, but dental medicine, all kinds of crazy things. Please ask them how they want to be addressed, all right? It really is a, a, a start to a good relationship. Other thing I want you to do here, and whether it's the school or in private practice, let's create office forms that reflect diverse gender identities. And I just want to see there's a little bit of an echo with the uh, audio, but I guess Kurt's left the house. Um, also, unisex or gender-neutral restroom facilities, I think that's an issue that I think is obvious to all of us. Also, ask patients how they want to be addressed. And I think I have here is absolutely critical. Do not assume anything, because there are too many times where somebody comes in with a partner and thinks, that's your wife. It's not your wife, it's my husband. Or something like that. Don't make the assumption. That's not your role. Your role is to start a dialogue, start a relationship. And you can do that by asking them how they want to be addressed and also by not assuming anything. Reviewing the medical history is easy. It's no different than any other cisgendered patient. But the key thing is developing that trust with the patient about, I'm going to respect your request for me to address you as he, she, they, Jane, Bob, whatever. And I'm going to give you an example. When I was transitioning, I did that with my primary care provider who was associated with the Boston Medical Center. And it was in the women's primary health care uh, clinic. I'm sitting there one day, and I look just like I do now, and there are other women, and this tech comes out of the back room. She comes out and she reads the name. She goes, Kenneth Koch. Everyone just sits there. She goes, Kenneth Koch. Then she bellows, Kenneth Koch. So I raised my hand. I said, come over here. I said, first of all, to you, it's Dr. Koch. <laughs> okay? And I said, secondly, we're going to make this an educational experience for you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write my name in the chart. She said, I can't do that. I said, yes, you can. I said, I've been doing this for 40 years. Yes, you can. She said, well, I don't know about Dr. Dr. Siegel, 
I said, if you ask Dr. Siegel, she's going to tell you the same thing. So Dr. Siegel, my primary care doc, happened to be walking by. So she asked Jennifer what to do. And immediately, in a nanosecond, Jennifer, you know, write, her, write her name in the chart. It's a, it's a no-brainer. And I ended up doing a training session for all the staff at Boston Medical Center. It's about consideration. It's about respect. It's about treating somebody like a human being, OK? Everybody here, you have a special, most everybody here, you have a special thing. You're a healthcare provider. You're a doctor. You're going to be allowed to touch people. I'm not talking about inappropriately. I'm talking about putting a hand on a wrist. It's going to be OK. No, it's, 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 this is going to work out. It's OK. That's a really special, unique gift that you have. It's, it's obviously an honor. Treat it like an honor. And never forget, whether you're a dentist, physician, nurse, hygienist, whatever, you're a healthcare professional. Have pride in that. So let's understand the patients. And I'm finding out, even with medical people, there's so much misinformation about trans guys, transgender women. What are they taking? Can they have babies? All these crazy things. With testosterone, you have to realize a couple of things. Testosterone is an incredibly, incredibly powerful drug. And the changes in transgender men, transgender guys, is very quick, and it's incredible. right? And we all probably have met some transgender guys who look great. Voice deepens, and that's a permanent change. The body hair, some of these guys are incredibly hairy. Uh, the facial hair growth and the male pattern baldness, it's really incredible. Um, I know a lot of transgender guys got the beard and they kind of have receding hair. And it's, it's a very common look with trans guys. Also, with prolonged testosterone use, you will get an increase in the size of the clitoris. And if you have a metoidioplasty done after that, it'll be like a micro uh, phallus. But these are permanent changes. In terms of non-permanent changes, yes, menses will stop. Yes, there'll be an increased strength and uh, a mass of muscle type of thing. You'll see some skin changes, particularly on younger trans guys. Uh, and there also will be a little bit of an increased sex drive. I know people in the medical community think a lot of post-menopausal natal women should think about testosterone. The adrenals produce testosterone. Testosterone does two things, even in, in, in cisgendered women. It's about sex drive and metabolism. And I think the metabolism aspect is very interesting. I see a lot of pear-shaped people. Like, what's going on here? The other thing with testosterone with guys, loss of fertility. There's a whole issue now about preservation of, of, of sperm or preservation of eggs, things like that. There's a whole special science to that now, and it's very successful. One of the things that I have seen with uh, trans guys I know is really this thing here of red facial flushing. It's really, uh, I have a couple of friends who are surgeons in this area, and you can always see the trans guys with this red facial flushing. Again, that's coming from the testosterone. Testosterone is an incredibly, incredibly powerful hormone. In terms of estrogen, now the effects can be different. In terms of breast development, uh, that'll be permanent, and that's very much age-related. There's always been kind of a, a rule, like one cup size smaller than your mother. Trust me, that stops at a certain age. You know, if you're transitioning uh, and you're 21 years old, that's very different than if you're transitioning at 60 years old. Okay? So there's a lot of different changes in the body. In terms of loss of muscle, decreased strength, yes. I will tell you that if you take it to completion, like I did, in terms of gender confirmation surgery, I probably lost 60% of my strength. But one of the things that's also a little bit of an issue, I still am convinced I maintain certain advantages for having been a guy for 63 years. And the number one advantage that I see in competitive tennis is stamina. I play big time tennis, and uh, most women, after three sets, they're done. And I can play five sets. I'm 67 years old. So someone said to them, well, you are a great athlete, Andy. Wait a second. This just needs to be studied more. That's why this thing needs legitimacy. There are a lot of issues that we don't have questions for right now. People have different agendas. I don't care about agendas. I care about the truth. So again, we're going to see this thought hopefully increase over the next few years. People always ask me about emotional changes, and they hold it against you. 
If you're a transgender woman or a transsexual woman, if you do something uh, stupid or you get angry, oh, it's because you're taking estrogen. Well, I didn't feel that it became more emotional on estrogen, but what I did feel, I felt that I was less inhibited sharing my emotions. That's a difference. I didn't think I was, oh my God, this is so fabulous. That didn't happen. But what, what did occur, I had no hesitation seeing things through a different prism. And you have to understand, when I did this entire thing, I had the luxury, I had the benefit of looking through two different prisms. I had the ability to look through the prism of a patient, which some of you in the audience have done as well. I also had the luxury of looking through the prism of having treated more than 30,000 patients in my career. That's a lot, okay? So I was able to see this from two different perspectives. Um, loss of fertility, I, obviously people are banking sperm now. There is an increased risk of blood clots. And in terms of an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, that needs to be studied more thoroughly. Here's one of the issues, and especially in this environment, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Too much of the research in transgender medicine is consensus-based. What transgender medicine needs is legitimate evidence-based research. Okay, that's what we all need. Evidence-based research, not just consensus-based research. Let's talk about surgical options. And this is something that people are totally confused about even in the medical community, even primary care providers practicing on Long Island, practicing in Nevada, practicing in Texas, Louisville, okay? In terms of your transgender guys, most of the gender confirmation surgery that transgender guys go and have is top surgery. There's probably less than 2% do the bottom surgery, and I'll talk about that in a second. In terms of your, your double mastectomy, there's two techniques that the surgeons can do. One is what they call a keyhole procedure, but a keyhole procedure is generally done on individuals with an egg cup breast development or less. Uh, so maybe sometimes in some young patients, but generally not too often do you see double, do you, do you see the keyhole procedure done. The procedure that's used, utilized most commonly with transgender guys is a double incision mastectomy. First incision is high up on a pex, high up in a pectoralis. Next one is inframammary. So what they then do is the surgeons make those incisions, they punch out both the nipple and the areola complex, then they remove the breast tissue, they suture the two lines together, and then they punch graft on the chest, the new chest wall, the areola uh, complex, as well as the nipple. In addition to punch grafting it on, they're gonna reduce the size of the nipple, they'll reduce the size of the areola complex, and for the transgender guy, they will put it higher up on the chest wall. So that whole complex is higher on a male than it is on a female. So if someone's gonna have a double mastectomy as a transgender guy, you wanna to go to a surgeon who has experience working with transgender guys. It's not just somebody who does mastectomies uh, on women uh, as a result of cancer, you want to have somebody who's worked in the world of doing double mastectomies for transgender guys. It's quite a different procedure. In terms of genital options, this is becoming a problem. Metoidioplasty is basically where, with prolonged testosterone use, you will get an enlargement of the clitoris. And what the surgeon then does is they go in and they sever the uh, ligament. Uh, it's the chordae clitoris. By severing that ligament, it elongates the clitoris, so it looks like a microphallus. A ring metoidioplasty is, combines urethral length ring. This is where the problems start, because if you understand laminar flow of liquids, both a phalloplasty and a metoidioplasty, is, they're fraught with complications. Second of all, when you do a urethral extension, in the past they used to extend it by taking mucosa from the cheek. They would take buccal mucosa and they would suture that in. Now they take it from the vagina and they suture it in. But what's the problem here? The problem here is complications resulting mainly from strictures and fistulas. And it's a huge complication rate and it's a problem. So a lot of these people who have this end up urinating from the base of the neophallus. But the one thing that people will try to do this is that if it's done and, and if somehow you get through and be one of the lucky ones, it gives the trans guy the ability to stand up when they urinate, and that's a big deal. The other thing that has been done in the past, 
It's not very popular because of the complication rate. That's phalloplasties. So what is the complication rate, Annie? Uh, how about 60 to 70 percent? And, a and this is, a, I think, pretty hideous procedure. They take a big graft from the radial forearm, and afterwards it looks like a severe burn, and most trans guys will have tattoos on it to try to cover the burn. And they will create a, uh, a phallus, and it's generally a, a, a very precise surgery, very complicated. It takes three specialties. It takes microsurgery, it takes plastics, and it takes urology. And there have been very few people who have done it. I've seen a lot of, can I use a common term here? I've seen a lot of dicks in my life, some physically, some figuratively, <laughs> okay? Um, and the phalloplasties that I've all seen, they don't look the same color. They look like billy clubs. Like, my God, that's a Louisville slugger, since I can say that since I'm in Louisville, all <laughs> right? Like, oh my God, that's a Louisville slugger, okay? So, um, but here's what's happening, here's what's going on, and here's why I'm here on this stage. I love the President Obama. I love all the initiatives he's done in healthcare, particularly for LGBT issues. There's a part of the ACA, uh, 1557, and that, and that makes insurance companies pay for certain techniques. Phalloplasties generally come with a fee of about $120,000. So now, for instance, Kaiser is obligated to pay 80% of that. So let me do the quick math, 80% of 120, oh my gosh, that's $96,000. That's a pretty good day in the OR. So now there's some people actually franchising offices doing phalloplasties. We now have this explosion of CE courses where you can learn to do a metoidioplasty and a phalloplasty on a weekend. I don't want to have a root canal done by somebody who only learned that in a weekend course in a Hilton. I sure as hell don't want to have a metoidioplasty or a phalloplasty. So things are getting a little bit out of control. Okay? Thank God, I've spoken to a couple of surgeons that said, have you been getting like overrun? No, because there's a really tight group with the transgender guys, there's a lot of different websites, and they're not buying it. What needs to be done is medicine. Legitimate medicine needs to find a, a better alternative for transgender guys than what currently exists. Is it going to be easy? No. This is very complicated surgery. So female to male is a lot more complicated than male to female. But the, the doctors deserve it, the hospitals deserve it, and most importantly of all, the patients deserve it. Cosmetic changes, you don't see a lot of cosmetic changes facially. Uh, most of the facial changes that you see in transgender medicine are male to female. Which leads me to, let's talk about male to female. Breast augmentation. Um, certainly anybody over 40 years old, if you're really thinking about doing this seriously, you're probably going to have to go in for a breast aug. Okay? I've seen some young transsexual women have incredible breast development. Okay? But as you get older, the effects that you're going to get from the estrogen are going to be less. And understand, if you're taking estradiol, you're going to take that with a blocker. And the blocker that we use in this country is spironolactone. And that may vary anywhere from 100 milligrams a day to 400 milligrams a day. But using that blocker in conjunction with the estrogen allows the estrogen to work a lot more effectively. But over 40, you're looking, you're talking augmentation. Got two types of breast implants out there. We all know that, saline and silicone. Certainly in the trans world, uh, there's been a, a swing over to silicone rather than saline. Uh, and and I, I certainly understand that and agree with that. Then the next big issue becomes on top of the muscle, under the muscle. All right? Most surgeons these days are doing under the muscle. Um, I ended up having a procedure done on top of the muscle, principally for two reasons. A, I'm really athletic. Uh, and B, I had very little breast development, even uh, having been on estrogen for a number of months. And understand, I did the entire thing in a manner that's not recommended. I did the entire thing, soup the nuts, in 14 months. Okay? So again, augmentation, saline uh, or silicone, you know, you're going to be able to have it on top of the muscle, under the muscle. Generally, people will go with silicone under the muscle. Here's another issue. When I did this, especially with older transitioners, it also applies for younger people. Have a game plan. What are you trying to accomplish? Have an image, okay? 
And my image was, I wanted to be able to go back to a Penn alumni reception as a professional woman. Okay? I also, you know, have spent a lot of time modeling. I've seen a lot of very famous models, nude and stuff like that, and I didn't see a lot of huge press. So for me, I went for a very, very small size. In fact, I went for the smallest possible, because that was my image. I realize that's a personal decision, but one of the things I'm going to say is that with a lot of transgender women, I see ginormous breast implants. And understand, one of the things, the men are going to have a larger carriage physically than women, and, and you all of a sudden put you know, 800cc mentor implants on top of that, trust me, honey, you're never buying off the rack, okay? And, and, and again, it's one of these things passing, everybody has their own image. My image, not for one instance, was ever to be a parody of a woman or an exaggerated, I just wanted to be a professional woman. But there's a lot of variation uh, on the breast implant thing size. Pick your size in conjunction with your physician and pick it with something that's going to work for you as the image as you see going forward. Genital reconstruction. Male to female is drop dead incredible what they can do. Okay? You could have all the surgeons are doing good jobs. I'm not in the business of any, recommending any one surgeon. Um, one of the things here, it's kind of like a green procedure. What they basically do is they do the penile inversion technique with dorsal sparing. Sounds pretty fancy, right? What does that mean? What that means is what they first go in is they make a, a midline incision at the scrotum. They remove the testes, and that's about the only thing they remove. They remove that, then they deglove the penis, and they take out the cavernous uh, corpusum there, the erectile tissue, and then they cut the glands in half, and then they have a dorsal section and a ventral section. And what they do is they take the half of the glands and that dorsal nerve, and that becomes a new clitoris. And then they use the ventral section and they invert the skin, and basically they're starting to create the vault. In terms of the scrotal tissue, they use that, they excise that, and they, what they do is they sew that on, for want of a better term, looks like a dildo, it's a dilator, and that's a stent. And so the scrotal tissue is then put into the body cavity as a skin graft, and that's what creates the neo vagina. And in terms of suturing, what you're basically suturing, you're suturing the scrotal tissue to the inverted penile tissue. That's the new vagina. Here's one of the really cool things about the surgery. Male urethra tissue and female urethra tissue are different. The female urethra tissue carries urine, but the male urethra tissue carries both urine and sperm, okay? So male urethra tissue has self-lubricating glands, and these are called the cells of Litra, L-I-T-T-R-E. So what they do, the surgeons save the male urethra tissue, they utilize it, they also use it to hood the clitoris, and so what, that, what does that do? It gives me the ability to lubricate. Do I have the ability to lubricate like a 25-year-old girl? Absolutely not nor does any natal 60-year-old woman, okay? So the male-to-female surgery is dead on in terms of aesthetics. It's functional, it's sensitive, everything is terrific. There's also the whole issue with uh, male-to-female, especially with older people, of facial feminization surgery procedures. This is one of the reasons why Norm Spack and others at Harvard Boston Children started basically puberty suppression regimens. That's a whole other issue, but the idea about doing that is that if somebody is trans and you stop the puberty, what you're doing is you're stopping the effects of testosterone. And the effects of testosterone that you're going to see very pronounced are going to be crackle, thyroid, orbital bossing, all those type of things. So we'll talk a little bit more about facial feminization surgery in a second, but this is basically some of the surgical options real quickly. Let me talk about this. Now let's make it personal, okay? I would recommend for anybody thinking about this to contact primary care or a therapist first. I was pretty certain I knew what I was doing with this, which is not recommended to do. So the first person I contacted was a plastic surgeon, because I didn't want to be seen as a clown, okay? I had no intention of being seen as a clown. That's me. Everybody doesn't have to be in the same frequency. So the first person I contacted was Jeff Spiegel, and I will never in my life ever have anything as terrifying as the first time I went out dressed as a woman. 
And that's when I went over to Jeff's office on Chestnut Hill. So I spoke to him about um, doing a couple of procedures. And instead of doing one incredibly long procedure, we ended up splitting it. And can we have the lights down a little bit? Take them down a little bit? Because I'm going to show some surgical pictures here. Can I go down a little bit more? Please? OK. So let's tell, fast forward to facial feminization surgery, OK? This is me when I came back from the hospital at three days. You can see I've got ecchymosis. Here's what I had done. I had a neck lift, and I had um, um, blepharoplasty, lower blepharoplasty, and I had two um, mentor cheek implants, male implants placed. This is day two at the hotel. I don't look like a happy camper here. I'm not too happy, OK? By day four, uh, I started to really swell up. And then by days five and six, I started to develop this kind of Planet of the Apes look. Okay. But now take a look at day seven and day eight. Oh my gosh. I look beat up, but guess what? I look like a beat up woman. Okay. All right. Let's fast forward two weeks back in my house. I kind of have this Edie Brickell thing going on, okay? you know, <laughs> bohemian thing. And then fast forward three weeks from that, five weeks out from the original procedure, oh my gosh, I became my mother. Okay? So my mother had been a singer for NBC, and this is me. And um, Jeff even shows that in his presentations, and I love it because that's what my image was. And uh, that's a, a really a very favorite picture of mine. I did go back for a second round later on, uh, and I did that 10 months later. And again, I look like Farah on the left, but on the right, I don't look anything like Farah. In terms of the genital confirmation, um, my choice was going into New Hope, and it was done with Dr. Christine McGinn. And um, Christine herself is a transsexual woman. She had been a Navy flight surgeon. That's kind of an dated picture of her, but nonetheless, she's a terrific surgeon and she's a nice lady. This is one of my favorite pictures. This was me, my last picture of me as Ken, uh, walking into the hospital on March 25th, 2013. And I kind of like it. It's, I think, a very feminine picture, the way I'm holding medical records. But I was pretty serene. This is really serene. <laughs> this is immediate post-op. The entire procedure took two hours and 20 minutes. I, I know some apical surgical procedures with residents that take longer than that, right? OK, two hours and 20 minutes. And here was the thing. I realized, you know, Annie, uh, you may be near death, but damn it, I'm not going to look like I'm near death. So I had my eyelashes and eyebrows tinted. And I think that's a pretty serene picture. Um, most surgeons take four to six hours. Christine's done a lot. And this is what the Swedes have found out. When you have people who do these gender confirmation surgery a lot, two things happen. First of all, their speed really increases. Secondly, the complication rate falls off the table. And, and I can be a perfect example of that. Things worked out really well. Things were done really quickly. I'm not talking fast and sloppy. I'm talking fast and very well done. Um, then I had a chance in recovery about dilation. This is a huge issue. Because what's the dilation schedule? How about five times a day for a half an hour each session for the first six months? If you don't do that, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose the neo vagina because the body's going to treat it like a wound. Here's a huge issue for me. We need to have evidence-based research. I don't need to have a, another study about the HIV rate among sex workers in Santiago, Chile. I, there's lots of studies like that. I want to know how many of Dr. McGinn's patients post-op five years out have attempted suicide. I want to know how many of Dr. Meltzer's patients 10 years out have attempted suicide. I want to know how many young transsexual women between high school and college, that first year in college, lost significant depth of the neo vagina. Why do I say that? Think about it. You go to college as a freshman, who has the time to dilate five times a day for a half an hour, much less the privacy. If you don't do that, you're going to lose it. 
And going back in and resurgerizing that after that scar is down is, is a mess. So if someone's doing this at the end of their high school year, I really think they should have a gap year. Let everything heal before you go on. That's the kind of research we need. Again, I've mentioned about the augmentation, 300 cc, classic profile on top of the muscle. And I, didn't, I, took, an, I took a Tylenol. I, I felt guilty, like I should take some kind of pain. I had no pain. If you go under the muscle, that's a lot more uncomfortable. Speak to anybody who's had an augmentation procedure under the muscle. This was me having fun. This was me in Hawaii a couple of years ago, and it was the date of my two-year anniversary. So I decided to have a friend take a picture. And as I always like to say, I don't think that's too bad for 65 years old and an ex-quarterback. <laughs> All right? Dental considerations. Okay, trans guys taking the testosterone. Biggest thing that I've seen here, uh, I've seen this issue here, plaque, periodontal disease, that kind of stuff. Haven't seen much of the xerostomia, although that's been reported in the literature. And one of the things is more on the social thing in terms of style of life, use of tobacco, okay? In terms of male to female transgender women, uh, there's been some studies done about synthetic estrogen with TMJ issues. I have never seen that. The one thing uh, you do see is almost like a pregnancy tumor. And not a lot of doctors working in transgender medicine use progesterone, but they will use progesterone if you have very little nipple development or really small areola. Um, I do use some progesterone, but I don't take a PO because of my age. I'm kind of worried about clotting. I use a compounded cream, and what the cream does for me, it really increases the size and, and deepen the color of my areolar complex, and it increases the nipple size. It's not like I'm an aroused woman in a penthouse magazine, but it's enough that if I'm wearing a t-shirt and stuff, it's clearly feminine nipples. But with these patients, if they are taking progesterone, especially PO, uh, you run the issue of um, inflamed gingiva, uh, gingivitis, also that pregnancy tumor. Medical considerations. Hyperventilation. Listen, it's much easier for a dental person treating a transgender person than it is for our medical colleagues. Medical colleagues get into the whole history. Treating a transgender dental patient should be no different than treating any other dental patient, okay? Hyperventilation. Oh, no. what, what do you mean hyperventilate? Have I ever seen a couple of queens hyperventilate in a bar? Of course I have, okay? Um, but that's not an issue. Syncope, um, I almost had syncope waiting for my first consultation with Jeff Spiegel, but I've never seen that. Um, and these other issues are basically not really an issue. The key thing here is I think transgender individuals, both male and female, have not taken advantage of the aesthetics that dental medicine offers. Again, I did PROS for 14 years. I knew what I was going to do, and when I had my crown and bridge changed, I said to my friend, I'd like to have a new crowns, but I said, um, I wanted to make my, my, my expression look more youthful. I couldn't say, I want to look like a woman. I couldn't say that to him at that point in time. But a lot of procedures that make you look more feminine actually make you look more youthful, both in, both in terms of facial, plastic procedures, as well as dental. So for me, male to female, a more rounded contour lends a much more feminine outlook. For trans guys, making it, making the distal edges, making that, making that transition angle a little bit more square lends a decidedly more masculine look to the dentition. Also, I think the greatest facial plastic surgery procedure in the world is a neck lift. That's what trans, cisgendered, whatever, male and female both, because what it does, it really improves your contour. It takes years off of you. Second best procedure to me is a procedure that 99% of natal women don't even know exists. And that's what we call a lip lift. The surgeon goes in right at the base of the nose, makes an incision, and what you're doing is you're reducing the length of the philtrum. The philtrum is that tissue from the bottom of the nose to the upper lip. When people talk about people aging, getting long in the tooth, they're actually getting long in the philtrum with a decreased lip. What we do with a, a lip lift is that you reduce the distance of the philtrum and you extrovert the upper lip a little bit. So it quickly takes 10 years off of you. So I think a lip lift 
is a procedure that's not done as much as it should be done. I think it's a fabulous procedure. Actual dental treatment of transgender patients is absolutely straightforward. What separates you as a professional is an understanding and an acceptance of the situation. There's no room, I have no tolerance for bigotry and prejudice. Real quickly, acceptance of colleagues. It took some time, but now it's happening. I'm out on the meetings, I'm out on the circuits. This is an interesting case. This was a person I went to school for many years with at Penn. I saw him at a dental meeting um, two years ago in Boston. So I said, hi, Arthur. So he goes, hi. And I realized he didn't recognize me. I said, you know me. He said, I do. I said, yeah, Dr. Koch. He goes, I got it. You're Ken Koch's wife. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, uh, not exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, this is right after David Bowie died. I was a big Bowie fan, so I kind of did the androge look with a couple of uh, endodontists. This is, me, my, this is my vibe. This is me with six of my eight postdoc residents down at Penn, and um, six beautiful ladies from six different countries. And, um, you know, work the sunnies and have some fun. And my nickname for this lady is Diva in Training. So it's, it's, it's fun. This was me last year at the PCOM. I said, I'm going to put together a transgender medicine uh, symposium, just like legitimate medicine. I'm going to get it funded. They said, you can't do that. First company I contacted was Cigna. They came up with $50,000. My old company, we used to do 220 CME events a year. It's about knowing the system. That's why I'm here, because I've let people have two and a half years of their own dalliances, and they don't know what they're doing. I know how to get things done. Time's run out. This is too important. Constructive things need to be put in place, constructive policies, constructive procedures. Um, I'm very active still with Penn. This was over in China for three weeks. And again, everywhere I go, it's like, wait, they knew me in China from a product I created called Bioceramics. And before we went over, Penn checked with the schools in China, in Wuhan, in Shanghai, and in Beijing, is it okay? Dr. Koch is different. It's now Dr. Ann Koch. When I showed up, they all knew me from the, the product and literature. You know what the biggest concern was with the Chinese doctors and students? Would I still like them and teach them? Think about that. So that was, they had no problem. I had 250 pictures from my experience in China. So it's a matter of people getting up. And for my medical colleagues, it's not lost upon me. I'm an endodontist. I'm a prostate, but I'm an endodontist. I need to see more medical colleagues getting up in front talking about these issues, please. Another thing I do, I'm very involved with the vet school. And the vet school is terrific. And a big issue for me is women's issues. Women's issues in medicine. Regular medicine, dental medicine, veterinary medicine. Misogyny is worse now than it was in 1975. I can talk about that from a unique perspective. It's very successful as an old white guy. And now I'm doing pretty good as a woman. I've seen both sides of the story, okay? Things have to improve. And I'm going to finish with this. This is my favorite picture. This was taken uh, two years ago at Penn. They had an Ann Koch day. How great was that? And uh, we had about, this was the LGBTQ group, and we had about 55 uh, students there. And then after dinner, as they started to leave, I realized, oh my god, I need to have a picture taken. I need to have a photo. So they took this picture. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a really close look at this. I want you to take a look at the heterogeneity in this picture. Look at all the different individuals. Look at the different backgrounds. I want you to look at this and think about, look at the diversity in this picture. And more than anything else, I want you to take a look at this picture, and I want you to think about and look at the humanity. Thank you very much. I hope that somehow during the day, I know a lot of you have come from outside the school and you have questions, come up to the front and corral me. I'll answer any question you have on any topic. But I know they have some other things going on at 1 o'clock.
you know, I try to keep it, make it, make it, make it yeah, a little yeah, bit fun, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. Again, thank you so much for filling out evaluations. There are boxes in the back where you can drop those outside of this room. For those of you who are involved in a meeting with Dr. Koch um, after this symposium, just stay and we're going to gather right here in the middle. Um, and we'll start in just a couple of minutes. Otherwise, for those of you who have questions for Dr. Koch, please come on up. She'd be happy to talk with you. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Hey, thanks, Stacy. Great job. <laughs> Wow, you got a great turnout here, huh? That's great. That's great. I know she's going to meet with a bunch of people here. That's a great opportunity. And uh, I know that Teresa is going to talk to her too about some of our protocols and uh, forums and stuff like that. So that's awesome. Yeah. I think we have some opportunities to make tiny tweaks to our Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's such a great speaker. And, uh, you know, gosh, you know, we should try to have to look to get her back here again sometime again. <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, that, that type of personality.